Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for um, joining us for the um, first uh, Magnet Seminar of 2021. Um, the series that we ran last year was, was very successful, uh, and it's really great to see uh, so many people uh, still coming in uh, already. We're over 70 and still counting. So it's really fantastic um, that we've got so many people here um, supporting our community um, through some sort of uh, challenging times that we're all facing. Um, so just a, a quick um, sort of note for, for people who haven't actually attended um, these seminars, because we've got a few new faces um, joining us now. Um, these seminars are typically on the order of 25 to um, 30 minutes long. We have a little bit of flexibility because I know Lisa has, has uh, gone for a slightly longer talk, but we'll squeeze, we'll squeeze it in. <laughs> Um, but can I just ask that everybody um, um, please keep your microphones muted um, while the presenter is, is speaking. Um, and if you're struggling with internet connection, um, if you turn your, mic uh, your video off, um, that can often um, improve some of the speed. Um, at the end of the seminar, we'll have a sort of 10 or, or, or 15 minute chance for, for questions and discussion. Um, you can either uh, raise your hand and, and ask an oral question, or you can type in into the chat window uh, and one of us, um, most likely myself, will uh, read out the question um, for you. Uh, and just a, a reminder that, you know, we all have life going on um, around us in the background. So if you have to, to, to go halfway through these seminars, um, just go. Uh, we all know what it's like uh, working from home or up early in the morning and all sorts of things going on. That doesn't apply to you, Lisa. You're here for the duration, I'm afraid. Um, and at the end of the seminar, we'll have a chance uh, for a bit of a catch up because we're all um, spread around the world and not really interacting with each other in the same ways that we used to. So there'll be time for a catch, a catch up and a chat uh, later on at the end. And that part of the seminar is not gonna be recorded. So it's, it's, it's um, uh, a bit more relaxed. Um, and so our speaker for today um, is, is Lisa Tokes. I'm really grateful for her for um, uh, speaking today uh, for our first seminar of 2021. And today she'll be talking about sort of understanding non-ideal paleointensity recorders in igneous rocks. So I will hand over to you, Lisa. Okay, can I share my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This works. Can y'all see that? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, I think I shared the wrong screen. Uh, um, do you have it in present review? Yeah, just a minute. Um, so let me share this screen. How's that? Can you see that? Or do yep. you see two slides or one slide? Uh, we see uh, one slide. Okay, great. Okay, so the talk today um, uh, is with my uh, collaborators, Christian Santos, uh, Brendan C. Zhang Zhou, uh, Andrew Roberts, Les Nudge, and Wynne Williams was the paper. And, um, and so I just, I'm going to launch in without you know, skipping all the jokes in the beginning and uh, talk about, I mean, mostly people in paleomagnetism understand that the basic laws of the paleo intensity experiment are that um, remnants is blocked at the same temperature at which it's unblocked, um, that uh, partial remnants that are blocked between two temperatures are independent of all the others and that the sum of the TRM acquired through a bunch of steps of peak TRM acquisition would be the same as the a total TRM. And when these laws are obeyed, you have an unblocking temperature spectrum and a blocking temperature spectrum. There's a little tiny red line inside the blue line. And so the blocking and unblocking are the same. Then we do this experiment. Um, uh, which is a Koenigsberger Tellier Tellier type experiment, but we do it in a particular way where we alternate in field steps and out of field steps. And this slide just kind of summarizes the experiment. 
Um, and then if you plot the magnetization remaining against the magnetization acquired at each step, you get a straight line, the slope of which is proportional to the field. So that's great. Now, what happens if the two, if we no longer have reciprocity? So the blocking temperature is higher. Blocking temperature spectrum is higher than the unblocking temperature spectrum. In this case, you'll get a, a downward bowed um, uh, RI plot on the right. That's a, the plot, the remnants remaining against the remnants gained, and it sags below the line. Now, I'm glad to see that Dunlop and Erzdemer are here because this was a great paper. Um, you have um, the, you give it a, they gave remnants to, um, uh, by cooling in a field between 370 and 350, and then demagnetized that remnants um, and found that much, a lot of the remnants started to decay well below the blocking temperature, giving rise to something we call low temperature tails, PTRM tails. And, um, and some of it remained <clears throat> after the blocking temperature, which are high temperature tails. And they did ERI, uh, they did um, uh, paleo intensity experiments on them and plotted something that looked a lot like an ERI plot, um, where you can see that all the, the coarser grains, the purple plus signs at 135 microns give significantly saggy. Um, ARI plots, whereas as the grain size gets smaller and smaller, you get straighter ARI plots. And um, I didn't notice for a long time, but that the, the X axis was normalized by the total TRM on the X axis and the Y axis was normalized by the original remnants. And so I thought from this diagram that you could just take the total TRM and get the right answer. But that may not be true as was, um, uh, shown by a few years later by Cross et al. 2003, where if you have very fine grained material, 60 nanometers, you get the right answer in the lab field. The, 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 le these experiments were done in 60 microtesla lab fields and you can see the figure on the left. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I can't even see my mouse, Never mind. Um, uh, the, that you get 59.3, you know, you get the right answer. Whereas for larger grain sizes, you can see the one on the right hand side is 12 micron um, material and it's underestimated by, uh, by, by hugely, it's 42 microtesla instead of 60. And, um, and that just seemed to be that the more curved the RI plots, the worse the uh, total TRM answer or the best fit line answer was. So is, does this happen in nature or is this only something about these just big synthetic magnetites? <clears throat> um, so I, um, I have been collecting data for a long time. And here are uh, four examples of four lava flows <coughs> that have specimens in the lava flow that gave very nice straight RI plots. That's the top row. And the bottom row are sister specimens from the same lava flow. And you can see that whereas the one historical lava flow that we have, this Hawaii 108, um, we know the answer. The answer was uh, uh, 39 um, microtesla is the correct answer. This, the ARI plot from the straight one got the right answer. Um, but the sister specimen from the same flow, uh, the best fit line and the total TRM are low by 30 microtesla. So very, very wrong, it's extremely low bias. And we found that if you take uh, straight ARI plots from lava flows in general, if you compare them to the results from curved ARI plots from the same lava flow, you tend to get an underestimate. So there is a bias associated with 
um, with uh, curved Ri plots. <clears throat> and it tends to be that uh, if they're downward sagged, that there's a negative, there's a low bias. And interestingly, if there's an upward bow, it tends to be overestimated. <laughs> Why? I don't know. And maybe we can figure this out. Um, but um, the, this, so the, um, the blue uh, circle is around one particular lava flow that we published in 2009. And um, we sampled this from Isla Socorro and the Pacific Ocean and, um, and found this. And I thought, because at the time, this was about in 2006, uh, we were talking in the community. I remember having conversations with many of you um, at many meetings about how we should be comparing unblocking with unblocking and not blocking with unblocking and so on and so forth. So I thought, well, why don't I just give this guy a fresh TRM and then do it properly? But the problem was that you can see that this is um, another pair, another sample from the same lava flow. Um, that um, the Ari plot in the original, from the original experiment, which is um, in the top diagram, was quite curved. But the uh, Ari plot, when we gave it a fresh TRM in the lab, is the lower right hand side, and you can see it's perfectly straight. So the curvature was not reproducible. And so, therefore, any attempt to compare. Um, the blocking temperature in the lab with the, with the unblocking temperature in the lab with the unblocking temperature in the original would not give a good result. Um, and I don't, I did, did not understand why uh, this happened. I couldn't, these are a couple hundred thousand year old lava flows. So VRM is not really an option here. And, um, and so I was puzzled. Uh, and I, I now call this behavior fragile curvature. So it's not, not the same thing that what Dunlop and Erzdemir were looking at or Krasa was, were looking at, which is a reproducible curvature. And that you can maybe uh, compensate for because it's reproducible in the lab. But this fragile curvature, which seems to be everywhere um, in natural samples, um, particularly lava flows, uh, is, is, a, is a bear. So um, how, um, um, that's, that's a, a bummer. Uh, so it started me thinking about this problem a while ago, what causes curvature in Ari plots and <laughs> what cause, why, what causes this fragile curvature does this fragile curvature, we start out with a nice straight Ari plot, does the fragile curvature increase with time? And are data from these kinds of samples uh, biased? And is there some hope? And it's the remedy part that I'm probably not going to get to today because you can see I have way too many slides. <laughs> so I, I can think right now of, of two sources of curvature. One is the stuff that Don Lepp and Erzdemir published about and Krasa, and uh, those are domain walls that produce this curvature, the separation of blocking and unblocking. And I think that um, that, that phenomenon is pretty well understood. Maybe not, but um, I'm not gonna worry about it because most of my samples don't have multi-domain grains in it or big multi-domains. But there's this fragile curvature, which is not reproducible. It causes a mystery. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I think it's a failure of the additivity test. And through micromagnetic modeling, I'm hoping that Les Nudge and Wen, Wen Williams can help me figure out what is going on. Um, and um, I mean, you can, you can imagine, I've got some guesses. We've got guesses. Um, and um, it is a serious problem because I think anything that is curved right now, I would be highly suspicious of the result. 
<laughs> so in order to investigate this further, Shar, Ron Shar, then my postdoc, and I took a bunch of samples that were curved ARI plots originally, gave them fresh TRMs, they were perfectly straight, and we, or we uh, aged them for two years and the curvature increased and the results were biased relative to the lab field. So then uh, Christian Santos was a master's student in my lab and um, we added, we decided to do it again this time taking what we considered to be ideal specimens. So uh, ones that had straight ARI plots to begin with and um, give them a fresh TRM and then do this experiment again. And so um, we did that and published it in 2019. We came up with uh, several categories of behavior. And here we used Greg's uh, marvelous uh, curvature criterion, which we just use it as a way to separate things that uh, into well-behaved straight ARI plots and poorly behaved curved ARI plots. So it's just a um, empirically based um, way of separating things that are quote unquote good from things that are quote unquote curved. So we had this behavior where we had four categories of behavior. One that the original TRMs in the upper left-hand corner were straight, perfectly straight. And then when we gave them a fresh TRM, they were perfectly straight. And we call those straight goes to straight and that's SS. Um, then we found a bunch that were straight in the original where actually it's only one lava flow, but it's a, it's a it kind of overrepresented because I thought they were straight. Um, the straight, uh, original ARI plot in the lower left-hand corner went to a curved ARI plot, but you can see it's a particular kind of curvature. It's got this high temperature hook to it. And so that we call the straight goes to curve. I'm not going to focus a lot on those. Um, and then there was this case, which was in the Sparbori study, um, where we had a lava flow that gave a curved all right, plot, and that's on the right-hand side, top row. Um, and then when we gave them uh, a fresh TRM in the lab, they became straight according to Greg's criteria. And you can see that it really did straighten out. And that's what I'm calling fragile curvature. Uh, and then there was this uh, set that started out curved um, and, um, went a lot straighter in the lower right-hand corner. They're much straighter, but they're still curved according to Greg's criterion. So these are the four categories of behavior. <clears throat> so then um, Christiane and I, and I pulled in some others to help me on this um, who are on the paper, um, took sister specimens from each of those samples, 10 sister specimens, um, unfortunately, you can't do this study using the same samples over and over again because we age them for a couple of years. And so we'd be here until um, the next century, probably trying to do this experiment. So we did it this way and there are design flaws, but that's just the reality of, of, uh, of how we had to do the experiment. So we took 10 sister specimens from each of those samples that I just uh, told you about. And we uh, gave them um, identical, uh, we, we gave them a TRM and a 70 microtesla field. Then we put them in various orientations to two different lab fields. So a 70 microtesla lab field parallel to the remnants is position one top row. So nothing should happen, right? It's it's in its equilibrium happy place. So nothing should change for position one in 70 microtesla. And we did it at uh, in five different positions. Then we also did a set where we aged it in a lower field of 35 microtesla, same positions. <laughs> and so we, um, for the study, the Tokes et al 2021 study, we aged them for two years 
and um, and did some rock mag on them to try to characterize them. I did have a whole set of slides to explain these figures, but I'm just gonna move on. On the left-hand side, most of you are familiar with the conventional fork diagrams. So the top one is a conventional fork diagram, the top left of one of the SS uh, specimens, straight, they're single domain, and they look single domain, right? I mean, sure, they're single domain. And then the SC, um, the ones that went, that had this hook on them, have this pirate hat, <coughs> um, distribution in the conventional fork. And you can see that uh, the one in the lower left, the uh, curved, has probably a lot of multi-domain in there. Then we did uh, the remnants forks and the transient fork and the induced fork. And the one on the right is this induced fork that Shangzhou came up with. Um, I think it was him. It might have been Andy. I don't know. One of those two. Um, and the induced fork has, has some features. And I don't understand them yet. Um, but the upper right hand is characteristic of single domain uh, material. You can see this in magnetic recording tape, you know, type section of, of, of single domain stuff. And, um, and the lower right hand corner is characteristic of multi domain uh, or multi axial large. Um, I mean, I think we call them casually multi domain, but they might be some of these weird, bizarre um, multi-axial vortex states, I don't know. Um, and you can see that it has this pattern of negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive up at the top, right-hand side. Um, and that's characteristic of the coarsest grains. Now these two middle eye forks <laughs> have a feature which I haven't seen described in the literature yet it's, I've called it N plus, so it's a double lobe of negative. You don't see it in the coarsest grains, you don't see it in the finest grains, and it's characteristic of a lot of lava flow type things, um, where you get this double negative um, in, the, in, uh, in the zone uh, one and three of the I fork. And so, I interpret this to mean that SS are single domain, mostly, and CC is a broad span of grain sizes between all the way from super paramagnetic up to perhaps multi-domain, some multi-domain. <coughs> and then um, the two middle ones, I think, are intermediate grain sizes that span the range from from um, uh, from small um, up to uh, up to single vortex and and um, and I I don't know any more than that. You guys can make something up. So uh, the next question is why are curves what what causes fragile curvature? It's reproducible curvature is in the multi domains state fragile curvature is characteristic of these medium grain sizes, the, the ones with the N plus, what I'm calling a butterfly uh, lobe in the I fork. And then we'll get to the rest of these um, questions later. So here's my guess that it, the, the fragile curvature has something to do with, um, I mean, the nail state is you have two stable states and it can go from one to the other. There's an energy barrier in between, but there's only two choices, left or right, and um, in nail theory. Um, but uh, of course, uh, Wynn and Les have pointed out that there's <clears throat> many more states. Um, I mean, Wynn was one of the discoverers of the vortex state in the beginning. And, along with uh, Dunlop and um, and my buddy Neil Bertram, but um, <clears throat> they discovered that there's these more complicated states. But that was in the late '80s, um, and so uh, now um, we know that there's some some 
very bizarre states in between single domain and in between single domain and vortex. And uh, that if you have a multiplicity of choice, I call it, it's sort of the tyranny of choice, then you can, you can have your blocking temperature change without changing the net magnetization, which is another feature that during the aging process, the NRM did not change at all. And yet you have this growth of, of curvature. So this is a, a, a kind of a weird thing, but I think it's explained by something on the right-hand side. And of course we need to do a lot more work on that, um, what could be causing it. But for now, the key question for me as a practicing paleomagnetist is uh, does fragile curvature increase with time? And two, are data from curved eri plots generally biased? And is there some way we can get around this? Because this is most of the data in the Pint database, I just have to say. So it's, it is serious. If we want to know anything about the ancient magnetic field, we have to solve this problem. So does curvature change with time? Um, on the left, you have uh, kernel density estimates of curvature in the fresh TRMs from the Santos study, the, uh, the 2019 study. And you can see that even the worst are uh, less than 0.4. That's still pretty bad. But then when you sit these same or these sister specimens in a field for two years, the curvature has uh, increased, not so much for the finest grain, the red curve there, which are the SS samples, but it changed a lot for the CC and, um, um, and the, um, CS and the SC to some extent. Yes. So um, those the x axes are the same on both of those plots. And so I can say, I think with some confidence that even over two years, the curvature of the RI plots um, increased significantly. And that dotted line is Greg's cutoff for uh, straight on the left of it um, and curved on the right. I, ho I hope you can't hear the screaming in the background. It's my grandson enjoying his breakfast. Um, so, so this fragile curvature exists even within our lifetimes, and um, and it's not explained by by any kind of viscous theory that involves Nael theory. So, um, the then the then the critical question is: Is what I said? Uh, true. I said in the beginning, I mean, I started the talk by saying, I think that things that are downward sagged are biased low, and this is bad. So let's see how these just two year aged uh, samples perform. So um, I lumped all the uh, fresh and aged results, the fresh results from the Santos uh, 2019 paper are the blue line, the uh, kernel density estimate for the, the blue line is clearly, the lab field was 70, as I said, and you can see that there is a bias to lower fields. You might say, well, it's only five microtesla, Lisa. Don't worry about it. But I said, this is only two years, come on. And if you, t if you take from those data, only the things that are curved, you get the solid blue line, which is clearly biased, and the solid red line, which is also biased. And if you take the straight uh, ARI plots from that same data set and do the same thing, you can see they're not biased. So there does seem to be a slight bias associated with um, curved ARI plots. And um, so now, um, do I have time to keep going, Greg? Yeah, yeah, you can go on for okay. another few more Perfect. minutes. So, so now we get to, well, what do we do about it? Um, and here are some ideas. Whoops. Um, you could do 
LTD Shaw method, which is supposed to knock out the multi-domain contribution. And Yuji Yamamoto, I gave him one of the sets of samples, which had been aged at the time, I think four years. Um, and his method, I can, he's writing up the paper, I think. Um, but basically what, the way he does it now is he'll reject the same samples that I do if I use Greg Patterson's curvature criterion to say, okay, I'm not going to use any curved results. That's what the uh, Cromwell criteria does. Um, uh, he rejects the same specimen. So his method works, but it doesn't get around this problem um, because he just shucks them out the way I do. So the multi-specimen technique was supposed to correct for multi-domain behavior. Um, and so let's try that. The, um, and, and it occurred to me after talking to uh, Thomas Berndt that um, maybe a fragile curvature is caused by these weird, unstable, the things I've been calling the bad boys. Um, maybe if we AF demagnetized the samples is part of our paleointensity experiment. So before each measurement, we just AF it at 10 micro millitesla. Maybe that solves a problem. Or maybe we just assume that there's a bias and correct for it. And that's the work of Brendan Seish. And I'm not going to talk about that because it's, I'm going to, uh, he's uh, working on a way to get around this that I think might work. I'm pretty excited. So, so um, I um, did some of these things. So I'm going to quickly show you the results. Brief history of the multi-specimen approach. It was first proposed by Hoffman, um, Ken Hoffman in 1989. And then Deckers and Bernal uh, refined it. And uh, their title is Reliable Absolute Pale Intensities Independent of Magnetic Domain State. So that should be a good place to start. Then Fabian and Leonhardt uh, refined it even more, and it's supposed to be uh, better for domain state correction. And so um, let's try those out on one of the sets of age specimens. So here <coughs> I took uh, one batch and applied the um, <clears throat> uh, did did the uh, Decker's Bernal approach to uh, this, the upper left is Decker's Bernal on our SS sample, so the single domain. And you can see that the, um, the result is, does not include the lab field, which was 70 microtesla. So this is not an accurate, this is inaccurate and it has low bias. And these are the single domain ones. Then if you do the Fabian and Leonhardt correction, um, it's uh, worse. So um, it has a, a, an expected field of 57 microtesla instead of 70. Then the, um, the ones with the hook, the, the hooked ones, the straight went curved um, ones, that's pretty accurate on the Decker's Bernal. But then when you apply the Fabian Leonhardt correction, it's inaccurate and a low bias. Then for the larger grain sizes, the um, Decker's Bernal method on the, the uh, CS samples, the ones with fragile curvature, you get the right answer, but it's extremely imprecise. Of course, I suppose you could do more specimens in there and try to tamp it down. And when you do the Fabian and Leonhardt correction, you get the right answer, right? It's, uh, it's pretty good. So, um, the, the curvature ones, uh, the, the coarsest grain ones, the CCs, um, the Decker's Bernal approach, it, the error bars include the right answer. Um, it's very imprecise. And, um, but when you apply the Decker's Bernal, the Fabian Leonhardt correction, you get the wrong answer and it's biased low. So I'm not very optimistic about this technique solving our problem because the thing it was supposed to fix were the things on the lower, um, lower uh, row there. So maybe there's another way. Um, uh, we uh, and that is to do this AF Izzy 
uh, technique. And so I did a bunch, or Christiane did a bunch on um, specimens from position two, the 35 microtesla and 70 microtesla um, fields. These are all of the remaining samples. Um, and so you can see on the top row, that's the results of our AF Izzy. Um, and you can see that on the right hand side as uh, a curved, went curved, this AF Izzy did not cure the curvature. And, uh, and I was hoping it would, but it doesn't. The stuff's still curved. It's still, and so is it still biased? So AF Izzy, um, here are the Curvature results uh, on the upper left-hand side. The, cur the results of AF Izzy, of course, these were, there's a, I mean, there's a technical difference between these. These were aged five years before we got around to measuring them instead of two years. So there is a slight difference. However, it seems pretty clear that AF Izzy resulted in worse curvature in all cases. And the total TRMs are um, interestingly for the finest grain material are um, biased high. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, and with the plain Izzy, uh, the curved results were biased low. So maybe five millitesnos is better. I don't know, but um, I'm I'm now uh, over curved results. And so um, what I wanna do is to encourage uh, Brendan Seish to work on, on his idea of how to fix this. So stay tuned. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Okay, questions? Excellent, thank you very much, Lisa. That was a, that was a really interesting. So somebody certainly thinks that's an interesting talk, if you can hear my background. Um, I'll just ask everybody to join me in a virtual round of applause for Lisa. You can do that through Zoom or you can just hold your hands up to the camera and, and clap. That was a really interesting um, presentation. So I will um, open open the floor to uh, any questions for, for Lisa. And I do have a bundle, so um, I will invite other people before I uh, jump in. I will say I'm loving your curvature parameter. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it, it's um, BS, BDS, not so much. But, yeah, I mean, but the, cur the curvature is a very much it's a you know an empirical thing. It's a geometry of of how the arrive plot um, behaves, and it's kind of intuitive that um, you have a higher chance of getting or selecting a sort of inac inaccurate result if your arrive plot isn't isn't straight. Um, so I'm going to jump in with a question about your multi-specimen stuff. Um, so you're comparing the um, the decorative Bonnell method and the um, uh, Fabian uh, corrective method. Mm -hmm. it, it, is that when you're doing the decorative Bonnell, that's just the original method. That's not taking the fraction correction into account, is it? No, it was just the original one as proposed, and then I used the Fabian. And but but that one, it seems to work better than the the, the main state corrected one of Fabian. So the um, I guess the, I mean the, the main state corrected one kind of always shifts the result downwards. It can never increase the intensity. But I wonder right. if if some of the results if, if you just did the fraction correction but not the domain state correction, if that might actually give. You know, we've got accurate and more, more precision, maybe. Um, something that, that could I'm not different. optimistic, maybe. Um, but but my feeling is that you don't know which category you're in if you do this. You only know that if you do a full uh, pale intensity experiment. Um, that and that only some of the specimens performed well with. Um, with the, any of the multi-specimen approaches. And so my feeling is that if, if your samples are, are curved or biased or 
have this fragile curvature that you're basically, um, if you don't know that, you are going to make a mistake. You're going to be, um, you're just not, yeah. you're going to have a biased result. Um, did, uh, sorry, Adrian, did you flash your hand up for a quick question? I don't see it up anymore. Um, but if anybody has a question, you can just raise your hand through Zoom. Otherwise, I will, I will just dominate and ask tons more questions. Uh, Claire, Claire has a question. Claire Nichols, on you go, Claire. Hi. Oh, I've looked at the wrong screen. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Lisa. Great talk. I was just wondering, with the, um, you see the bias after two years, it's five microtesla. And I guess if that's a linear bias that gets worse most of the time, then it's a big problem. But do you know if it actually gets much worse very quickly and then kind of settles or if it continues like is it twice as bad after five years <laughs> it's time talking in five years yeah. <laughs> I, I just uh in order to do these last two experiments the last three ideas i used up all the specimens that were aging and so now we don't have any more so someone else can start i just retired so i'm <laughs> I'll be here to get to the answer. Um, uh, I think it keeps getting worse. I don't know the answer. If you look at the original ARI plots for some of these, they're really very curved. And so I imagine that the curvature just keeps, you know, over 100,000 years. I don't know. Okay. Have to start aging <laughs> some samples. <laughs> Why don't you do it? <laughs> we'll talk to you in five years, 10 yeah. years. So it sounds like somebody could start a career out of this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Andre, you have your hand up. Oh, okay, now my sound is it's okay now. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay, Lisa. Uh, well, uh, there is a br brief question and also a sort of suggestion. Uh, uh, first, uh, when you see uh, in your curved uh, uh, Nagata Rai plots, uh, uh, how did your PTRM checks generally behave? Oh, they... well, these samples were chosen because they had all undergone uh, Atelier experiment and had shown no alteration. So the alteration checks on these were fine. That's not the issue here in this yeah. case. All right. That's uh, <laughs> still uh, okay. I may, I'm, I may be blowing in my own trumpet, but uh, okay. Uh, some 20, 20 plus years ago, Michel, Michel Prevost and I published the, the paper which showed what you call fragile uh, uh, curvature and we did the same uh, we did basically the same experiment with two did the oh, what was that published tell me we published the, the the paper in ggi in 98 uh, i'm still on this chat andre yeah and uh, we did basically the same experiment and uh, ended up with uh, basically the same uh, the same uh, conclusion that uh, you have you have very very curved uh, Nagata Rai plot on original uh, samples, and then you get uh, almost straight lines when you do the TLA experiment on the T, uh, uh, total TRM. And we we did the we, we went a little bit f f further on uh, on the Rockmag line and uh, investigated the uh, hysteresis loops at uh, elevated temperatures. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, we found out that um, uh, in all uh, in, in all these uh, samples with uh, uh, fragile curvature was well, good good term. Okay, uh, uh, they showed uh, they showed up very very characteristic changes in coercivity when, uh, upon heating, and it it was sufficient to heat up the samples to. Uh, something like to, to 250 to 75 degrees centigrade to end up with very with uh, clearly uh, irreversible behavior of high of high stress. and mm -hmm. our our interpretation with Michelle was that 
uh, when you hit the uh, when you hit the samples uh, with this uh, and uh, we change this uh, the internal stresses which co uh, which controls the corrosivity mm -hmm. and that's um, and unfortunately the answer to your last question seems that there is no remedy apart from this perhaps this uh, if, if this interpretation is correct, uh, then the, our only hope would be this numerical correction. But once again, we, we need to figure out how to do that properly. So maybe Brendan can give a seminar in a, a, yeah, maybe yeah. A, month, a couple of weeks or a month because um, he's about to submit a manuscript, which I, I think maybe a way forward yeah because uh, and uh, uh, one thing to uh, one thing to re recall about this whole study was that the, uh, pro um, the worst uh, curved sample was the uh, was one with the largest mrs ms uh, ratio of mm -hmm. something the 0 0.3 so it was nearly in the single domain verge i don't want yeah. to and uh, the coercivity was uh, something like 40, uh, 30 millitesla, and still it behaved uh, terribly. But mind you, but in that case, uh, we did see the we did see the uh, failed PTRM checks at the uh, where, uh, where the uh, where the curvature was developing because mm -hmm. well the uh, okay they, the, yeah. Richard has a question now. So yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll move on to Richard, otherwise we'll, yeah. we'll lose all of our time. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so a non paleomagnetist question. So implications. Um, so we spent many years doing analysis of all sorts of, or putting into models all sorts of data. So mm -hmm. for example, it always puzzled me that the field seems to be stronger now than it was in the past. Could this be mm -hmm. part of the, the story behind that? Um, is this only volcanic? So uh, Archimag? Oh, uh, no, uh, but um, I, I do think that the field is stronger in the present than in the past, because if you choose only uh, good results that have straight RI plots, that's what it shows. So I, I'm confident now, but this does raise a question. So how, how about results in uh, databases that do not include the original measurements, what confidence can we have in those results? Like, for example, the Pint database that has just studied, uh, just site level uh, estimates, and you have no idea about where they curve, where they not curve, where were they? Yeah. So um, uh, I'm advocating for people putting their data into the database and the good news is that if Brendan's method does work, then we can rescue a lot of results and correct for this bias. Okay. But um, uh, for now, uh, you know, that story about the high field recently is, is uh, a lot of archaeological data and archaeological artifacts. I mean, Despi was on, uh, she can attest to the fact that m a lot of um, archaeological, archaeomagnetic data are really great. They're straight RI plots. They're not, don't have this problem. Uh, it's only when you get back further and further in time. And I would say that this is a general problem of lava flows, but not of the lava flow tops, uh, which are glassy or finer grained. And then you get yourself into the single domain range. And so you can get good results from lava flows as shown by Cromwell. Uh, and, um, and that's been our approach for the last 30, 30 years, 20, the long time, 20, since 1990, I started trying to find single domain material. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very but, pleased that you're not throwing away the glassy everything, otherwise you might disappear out your own. Um, so so that, well, that's very good to hear. I'm not throwing away the glassy stuff, although Dooley Bowles might for me, <laughs> for some <laughs> other reason. <laughs> I don't know. No, no but I, mean, I can appreciate what you're saying, but... <laughs> Try, trying to find the best data. But when you were going through your conditions, I have to admit, I was less worried about the one that was kind of imprecise, but at least accurate, 
I didn't care so much no. because the, it's the it's the consistent, it's the uh, systematic bias that's the problem. If you've got inaccurate but accurate but or accurate but um, wide yeah. bounds, then just take lots of the data. That's right. So yeah. that's that's our point. But anyway, um, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, Give me another five years. Sorry. Give me another five years and maybe we'll solve it. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank uh, Lisa again um, for uh, a fantastic talk. There's some really interesting stuff in there, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, some of the future stuff. Um, as a note, because you kept men mentioning Brendan's uh, method, and Brendan should give a presentation, he, um, Brendan Sitch actually gave a presentation as part of uh, Magnetic Interactions um, earlier uh, this year. Um, we, as part of Magnets, we recorded that seminar. Uh, one of my magnets duties is to uh, uh, upload all of those videos online, uh, which is coming. They are um, coming on so everyone um, can catch up on, on uh, Magnetic Interactions um, 2020 and, and, and Brendan's talk and his uh, pretty cool looking method of, of correcting um, some of these uh, biases. So I just want to thank uh, Lisa once again, and, and you can throw up another virtual uh, round of applause for, for Lisa for a fantastic talk. Um, and um, before we um, bring um, today's sort of session to, to a close, um, I just want to remind everybody um, that, that moving into 2021, we've got um, several more people uh, lined up to, to give um, presentations. So we're going to be running the seminars um, every two weeks. Uh, and you can see that we've, we've already got um, uh, our lineup for the next um, few weeks, a uh, few months, sorry. Um, we're going to take a break for uh, EGU um, to give people um, a little bit of a chance to uh, not be bombarded by too many um, uh, seminars. Um, but after EGU, we're actually going to change um, our time slot a little bit um, so that we're running in a, an EU um, Eastern Hemisphere slot so that we have a chance for uh, some of our colleagues in Australia and China and Japan to, to join these seminars live, but also to, to actually um, present some of the science that, that they're doing. Um, and I'll give more details about that um, later on as we get closer to that time. But we've got a few, a few people lined up um, to give a range of, of talks. Um, and as we move forward into 2021, um, we're, we're always looking for more speakers. So if anybody is interested in, in giving a seminar, um, please just um, get in touch with us uh, and we can sort out a, a future slot. Um, and one last uh, little mention is um, up until now, um, our uh, magnet seminars have been made available through the Magic YouTube channel. And I wanna thank uh, the Magic team for helping us get started and, and host that. Um, moving forward, we will have our own dedicated uh, Magnets YouTube channel where these videos will be um, uploaded. Um, well, I'll, I'll send around some more details uh, for the web links and so on there. But this will um, have our 2021 series and it'll have uh, Marinetic Interactions uh, seminars as well. But I'll pass those uh, details around. Um, and as always, um, any feedback, ideas and criticisms um, are always welcome to, to improve um, our community uh, seminar series. But thank you all again um, for, for joining uh, Magnets and I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. <laughs>